going to talk right now with Chris Middleton about what he sees going on here, Chief Investment Officer at Middleman Brothers. Uh, let me ask you, first of all, about that, what looks like a little bit of optimism leading the weekend. We have uh, so many question marks right at the end of the week with the debt ceiling discussions, with the stress tests over in Europe, what happens uh, over there, even with earnings, really, although we got some pretty good numbers from a few companies. What do you see happening going forward as far as the big picture is concerned? Well, we're long-term, fundamental, bottom-up investors. We don't necessarily let the short-term day-to-day news affect us too much, but we recognize markets are very uh, torn between the concern about economic weakness for surging. There's every day that we had a different indicator. Uh, last, uh, we had a few weeks ago, a weak jobs report, market plummeted. You had a good purchasing manager's number, market goes up. We try to not focus on those things and just focus on the long-term value that we perceive in the companies that we own. And so while investors are constantly being whipsawed back and forth by news of uh, whether the debt ceiling negotiations are making progress or whether, uh, you know, Greece is going to default on their debt. You know, these are kind of noise in the background for us, and, and we're trying to focus more on the individual situations that we own. All right, so are you finding a lot of opportunity? I mean, is this the right kind of market for you guys to be looking around in? It's always the right time, kind of market. The, the market today, to me, is no different than the market 20 years ago. There's always pockets of opportunity, no matter what the macroeconomic concerns are at that moment. So, yes, we, we're finding some great values. Although, uh, over the big picture, I mean, you can see that coming back uh, from a balance sheet crisis like this is painful, a long process. It's not something that goes away in a week or a month or a year or even two or three years. That's true. That's true. There will be a much more, it's a more difficult type of economic crisis to recover from, and that's going to take maybe longer for a jobless uh, unemployment to get back to a normal level. But that doesn't mean that there aren't companies making good money along the way. Uh, we're invested in a company called Spectrum Brands. It's been down 20-some uh, percent in the last uh, month or so. But this is a business that's entirely recession-resistant. Uh, EBITDA has grown from uh, about 200. What do they do? Entirely recession-resistant? Well, Sounds fantastic. Yeah, well, they, they sell batteries. They sell uh, consumer uh, goods that you might find in your home, like uh, Toastmaster, uh, they have a spectricide for killing bugs and also cutter for keeping bugs get, from getting on you. It's a broad They're, range of products. It's a broad range of products, but these, these products are not going to be affected by, you know, uh, macroeconomic concerns. People keep buying them. So there's a steady demand for that, and as a result, they have steady cash flows. The stock, we think, is worth $50 a share. That would be about eight and a half times EBITDA. EBITDA should be about $510 million next year and about 13 times free cash flow. Hey, Chris, you know, I think it's really topical. You're talking about Spectrum Brands, and they have a diverse line of products. Another company in the news big time today is Clorox that also has a diverse uh, group of products. They have Clorox, they have Burt's Bees, they have Hidden Valley. Uh, Julie, let me bring you in because you've been following very closely Carl Icahn's kind of interesting move towards Clorox today. I have been following this interesting move, and what he really wants and making a bid for the company is for others to come in and make bids for the company. But some analysts are saying that one of the problems with that may be that Clorox is sort of all over the place and that in finding a buyer, you would have to find someone who wanted that breadth of products, everything from Glad trash bags to Burt's Bee. So, uh, Chris, I would ask you as well, I mean, is that an issue when you're looking at Spectrum? Are there different growth rates when you're looking at the different products? And is that going to be an issue for the, the company overall? Well, well none, of, none of these companies are high growers uh, in the traditional sense. But they do have this steady free cash flow generation that attracts private equity buyers, guys like Carl Icahn. But what I would point out is that Icahn is uh, proposed to buy Clorox for something north of 10 times their EBITDA and about 15 times free cash flow. If you look at another consumer products conglomerate, Fortune Brands, that's trading also about 10 times EBITDA, again, 15 times free cash flow. So those are not unreasonable values, but we're trying to find, we're focusing on companies like Spectrum Brands that are trading well below that level. You know, Chris, eight and a half times is, is what we're looking for. Chris, I want to jump in here for a second because, you know, a lot of investors, they look at these conglomerate stocks, and the reason they think there's so much upside is because they do a sum of the parts analysis, right? They apply the EBITDA multiples to each of the different businesses and say, hey, this is the upside we're going to get. The problem is all of these companies have been talking about being breakup candidates for a long time. It's been really hard to see that happen. I mean, whether you have tax issues or spin-off issues, I mean, how do you describe that, uh, some of the parts value when it's really tough to actually break apart these businesses? 
Well, I don't think it is that tough if you want to do it. I mean, there are certain regulations, uh, especially with regard to taxes, you have to consider. But if you want to sell a good business, especially in this environment, there are going to be buyers. We've seen private equity activity pick up tremendously, and there's a lot of cash. Private equity buyers have huge amounts of cash, and they're not going to give that cash back to their investors. They're going to spend it at some point, especially with interest rates where they are. So I, I would not be surprised if Icon is successful in prodding someone to buy Clorox. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if Ackman is successful in getting Fortune brands to, to break apart, and, and that, that worked out successfully. Hey, Chris, I want to get to another pick, because I was, I was, you know, it was interesting to read what you, the picks that you had, because they're not necessarily household uh, names. One of them is KT Corp. The stock's down about 9% so far this year. It's actually a pretty tough chart uh, for the year, but yet you guys like it, you own it. Why is that? And talk to us a little bit about what they do. Well, we, we bought the stock uh, in June uh, when it was already down. We paid around 18.33 with a 6% dividend yield. KT Corp, you can imagine it like a Verizon in the United States. It's the largest fixed line uh, phone operator in Korea, and they're also the second largest mobile phone operator. They have about 30% market share of the 50 million phone users, mobile phone users in South Korea. 75% uh, of their business comes from wireless, internet, and data. And we think the multiple is, is just obscenely low. We think the stock should be $30. That would be about four and a half times the 4.8 billion of EBITDA they, they should generate in the coming year. And that's, that's a, a Verizon trades at 5.6 times EBITDA. And they have, I don't think, any better growth prospects than KT Corp does. So it's not well known here, it's not well followed here, but it's a great value. And it's a substantial business, about a $10 billion market cap. What's the story with Carmike Cinemas? I mean, Carol has done a, a lot of work, a lot of reporting on the cinema industry. We've learned through her work that, you know, people just aren't going to the movie theaters the way they used to. And this company operates movie theaters in sort of rural America, right? Right. Well, the movie theater business uh, is not a cyclical business in the sense that it doesn't go up and down with GDP, but it has its own cycle. The cycle is how popular the movies are. Last year, you had Avatar, the big thing. It's hard to reproduce such a huge win like Avatar. Avatar. So we're down about 8.6% in terms of box office receipts year to date. Um, that's a bit more than they would normally go down in any given year. But it's a business that's grown over time. Last year was an all-time record year for box office receipts. So it's not a dying industry. And, uh, and we think um, Carmike is worth, stock is uh, small cap stocks. So you have to be very careful with it. Uh, no market orders. But uh, it's a $6.8 stock right now. That's something we think is worth 12. That would be about seven times EBITDA, about 10 times free cash flow. Their competitors, Regal and Cinemark, are already trading at those multiples or more than that. So it's a good it's a good business. They have an insulation in their market because they operate in these small towns. There's no competition for 10 or 20 miles for the most part. And so, you know, they're, they're, they have a moat around the business, as Warren Buffett would say. You're not going to see a lot of competition for them in that, in that it's area. It's true. It's yeah. true. I go to the movie theater in Bronxville. They only have three screens, but where else am I going to go? Yeah, and Harry Potter's out uh, this weekend, and that should be a huge, huge movie. So it could be a good time to people, for people to look at Carmike. Hey, Chris, it's Adam. Let me jump in here. You sound like a guy who's focused a lot on cash flow. So as you're screening for stocks, which groups are seeing the, the, the biggest increases in cash flow? Oh, uh, well, in the theater companies, there's only a, a handful of publicly traded companies. So you're looking at Regal, you're looking at Cinemark, and you're basically looking at Carmike. So those are really the big three. Um, there's another company, uh, AMC, but that's privately traded. We think that the cash flow growths are not going to be uh, tremendous for any of these companies. As a matter of fact, we're not anticipating uh, big growth. But when you have such a low valuation, you don't need growth. It's, it's like buying a bond with a coupon, and you're getting a current yield. The, the, the free cash flow yield on Carmike today is, is uh, over 15%. Uh, so if the business didn't grow at all, you would be getting basically 15% cash on cash return if you bought that whole company today. Hey, very interesting stuff, Chris. Great to get these uh, picks from you.